Um, so today I want to we'll, we'll talk about planarity again, the idea of planarity. We've been talking about it last time because we figured out how to color planar graphs with five colors and we talked about the four color theorem. And what I want to talk about uh, with the goal of coloring them is drawing graphs on other surfaces, right? So you can draw graphs like we call them planar graphs and drew them on the plane. And drawing on the plane is equivalent to drawing on the sphere. Um, I'll let you guys think about that. That's a common thing in topology. But basically, if you can draw on a sphere, you can project that sphere down or you can unfold the, the sphere into a piece of paper. And if you can avoid crossings on the plane, it's the same as avoiding them drawing on the sphere. Um, the idea of the unbounded face is just, is just one more face. It's on the sphere instead. It's no longer unbounded, but it's part of the sphere. So those two are equivalent. I don't want to say more than that, but just keep in mind that when I talk about drawing a planar graph, I'm really talking about can I draw it on a sphere um, or, or really a surface. It doesn't have to be a sphere, right? Topologically, it could be like a, some ball shape, right? Genus zero is, is what we call it. Okay. So the question is, what about drawing graphs on other surfaces? OK. Um, so we already know we've drawn the sphere equals the plane as far as we're concerned there. And we have some pretty good theorems for that, right? We have an edge bound. We have the Euler characteristic equation. Um, we have Kuratowski's theorem, right? We know by Kuratowski's theorem or Wagner's theorem exactly what is and isn't planar, right? Whether or not you have a subdivision of a K5 or K33 or K5 or K33 minor, if you want to use the other version we didn't talk about in class. Um, and then we have the Euler characteristic where we had vertices minus edges plus faces always equals two. So we have this like whole wealth of information, but all that depends on it being on the, the sphere and the plane here. Okay. So I'm going to start maybe with an example here. Um, the next surface of some interest is the torus, right? I mean, there's infinitely many surfaces you can talk about, but the natural one, if we're you know going to go beyond uh, spheres, is a torus. So like uh, draw on a torus, for instance. Okay, so I'm gonna draw, be drawing a few toruses today. So you have to bear with me here. I, I wanna make them large enough because I'm gonna try and draw some stuff here. So remember, tor torus is just the donut shape. I'm gonna make the small the hole here relatively small. Okay, so torus is just a donut. If you haven't taken topology or come across these objects before. And I wanna draw a planar graph on the torus here. And what I'm going to do here is show that there's things you can draw on the torus that you can't draw on the plane. So drawing on a torus is different, OK? So let's try and draw a K5 here, OK? We know a K5 can't be drawn in the plane or on a sphere. So if we can draw it on the torus, then it means that this is a different scenario. Different stuff can happen, OK? So let's try and draw a K5. And I'm going to draw it as follows. I'm going to put a vertex here. Um, is that what I want? Yeah, in the middle and surround it with five points. Sorry, with four points, right? We're going to try and draw a K5. And I'm going to join them like this. So the central vertex here has degree five, so it's going to be fine. And then I'm going to join these ones around the outside like this. OK. And then what I'm going to do is ordinarily, if we were drawing on the plane, what would happen? I join this point to this point here. Whoa, OK. Let me do that for illustration purposes real quick here. I'd go, I draw it like this, and then I'd be like, oh, I'm stuck. This point's never going to be able to get over to this point here if I was drawing on the plane. But you notice the torus allows me to do some cool stuff. I can draw, go up here around the donut. This is the back side of the donut, and then resurface here. So the top two are joined to each other by going around the donut. And then that doesn't block these two points now from being joined to each other because now I can go the long way around the donut. So let's let's draw it like this. It goes here and then it goes around the back of the donut and then comes around the front here. And now notice any pair of vertices are joined by an edge in this picture here. And this red and blue edge don't cross because there's this, this alternate route that we can take that we couldn't take on the sphere, right? You try to do the same thing on the sphere and like you don't, the red edge doesn't have an option it'll have to cross because if there's no hole in the middle here, imagine the blue edge goes around you know, the equator. 
then the red edge has to go up around the top and it, it would cross the blue edge on the back of the, the, of the planet, the back of the sphere. But the donut, it allows you to do this, okay? So um, we can say, we need a different term. I don't wanna say that K5 is planar on the torus because plane refers to the plane. So we're just gonna say that it's embeddable. So if, if I say it's embeddable, I mean it's embeddable without crossing edges, okay? So uh, let's just say, or this, I mean, we can call this a definition, okay? Uh, a lot of today is going to be uh, sketchy. I'm not going to like go through all the details. So I just want to get through the concepts here. So we'll say that uh, K5 is embeddable. I don't know how to even spell embeddable um, on the torus. Now, this isn't even a definition. This is like a, I don't know. It's a theorem. We just proved it by doing it. Um, and this, this, I'm also at the same time defining this term. Okay, I hope it's clear. When I say embeddable on that surface, it means I can do it without crossings. I don't, I don't want to have to say the whole mouthful every time. Okay. Yes, exactly. Cameron points, Cameron points out the utility problem, which is the whether you can draw K33 or not, also can be drawn on the torus. It's a good little exercise. I won't, I won't show you that one, but K33, which we can't draw on the plane, can be drawn on the torus as well. Not a terrible, terribly large surprise as well there. Remember the K33 has... Like every time you try to draw it, you get one crossing edge. And you can think of a torus as having like a bridge and you could draw it on there, okay? Let me even give another hint for that idea because we're gonna use that in a little bit. Um, what you can actually do is think of a torus, and we're gonna use this concept in a moment here, as a sphere with a handle added to it. All right, and so there's these connection points. Topologically, these two things are the same here. And so if I'm trying to draw like a K33 or a K5 and I know there's one crossing, draw as much as you can until you get to that point where you're gonna have to use a crossing. Put the two end vertices of the crossing here and here and take that edge that would have to cross and make it travel across the bridge here. And it'll it like, you know, it goes up into space off the surface of the earth and avoids crossing. You get like one option to go in the, in the third dimension. That's like the rough idea to avoid the crossing. And actually, um, what this tells us is that if you want to draw uh, a graph that has a certain crossing number, right, the minimum number of crossings you need, all you need to do is add as many handles as that crossing number, and you can get a, you can avoid all the crossings there. Okay, and so when I say number of handles, this this is a concrete concept in topology. So let me define that real quick. Um, so we've got that. Okay, so definition. Um, the genus of a surface, whatever surface means, I'm not going to define it beyond that. Um, it's just the number of holes, okay, is the number of quote unquote holes. Uh, I'm just going to say that, okay? And it's even easier to just look at an example. We'll just look at three. So, for example, uh, the sphere. Uh, has genus zero, right? The genus, we'll denote it by G in this class. Um, so the sphere has that. The torus, let me draw another torus here. The torus has G equals one. There's one hole in this object. And then you can make other objects like the torus with multiple holes. I mean, basically, they all come down to objects of this type here. So you can also do the, I don't know if this one has a special name, but, and this one has two holes, right? One hole there, one hole there, genus g equals two, and so on. So you can, yeah, obviously, you can keep adding handles to this thing here, right? You make one three and four and five and so on. And genus just records the number of holes here, which is equivalent to like, if I draw it, like this, it's the equivalent to adding more handles to this one here too, right? These like ears. Think of these as like in St. Louis, right? The big arch that just comes off the ground. You've got multiple of these and this gives you alternate routes for like getting around without crossing someone's path, okay? And so um, that's the genus of a surface. And sometimes we talk about the genus of a graph graph is, um, how did I define this here? It's the minimum G such that G is embeddable 
on a surface of genus uh, G. Okay. So as I add holes to my shape, I can embed more and more and more and more graphs on there. Okay. Um, the genus of the surface records the number of holes. And the question, what's the genus of the graph is how many holes do I need in order to be able to embed G on that surface? Okay. And there's some topology to convince yourself that, you know, two surfaces with the same genus are equivalent as far as the graph is concerned for embedding. Right. I mean, maybe that's not totally obvious to you, but, but it is, it is true, but that's, that's pure topology. Okay. So for instance, um, planar graphs have genus what? Just as a sanity check here that we're understanding the definition. What's the genus of a planar graph according to this definition? Zero. Yeah, it's zero, right? It's the minimum G such that it's embeddable on a surface of a genus G. Well, planar graphs are embeddable on a sphere which has a genus zero. Obviously, you can't go below zero. Um, yeah, okay. So, i.e., this implies planar has genus zero. And what did we just actually prove about uh, K5? What's the genus of K5 then? It's one, right? It's not zero because it's not planar. And we showed it's one because we showed that it actually can be embedded on the torus, right? So it doesn't need to be more, okay? And then actually, I'm not gonna prove this, but we actually basically discussed this. I, I explained the idea here, um, the genus, of G is never, never needs to exceed the crossing number of G. Okay, and that, that was what I discussed. If you embed G with as few crossings as possible, you can add uh, a handle to the sphere for each of those crossings to make those crossings disappear. Okay, again, not completely obvious. There's definitely some topology going on, right? It's like, well, okay, there's a crossing here. And if I add a handle at, right at that vertex, then one of the crossings can like go up there. But like, you know, I have to do that multiple times. Maybe they interfere with each other somehow. I mean, anyway, so I'm not going to prove this, but this thing is true here. So the genus is always bounded above by the crossing number. What this means then is that every graph does have a surface on which it can be embedded and have no crossings, right? Obvious, I mean, yeah, because obviously the crossing number is finite. You can't have more crossings than you have like pairs of edges, obviously, right? In fact, we, we, even, we even made an upper bound on the crossing number earlier in the class. And the genus is no more than that. So genus of a graph is always like an actual number. Um, it's not infinite. Okay, so uh, let me do another interesting example here because this one here, embedding the K5 on the torus doesn't quite answer the question, right? Maybe we can embed more things on the torus, like bigger complete graphs. And I'd like to do that, okay? So, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna embed the K7. So you can do five, six, and seven. So adding one, one loop um, allowed me to actually get all the way up to K7, which is interesting. It actually also says something about the crossing number of K7, right? It means that you can draw K7 and not have that many crossings as well. So maybe somewhat surprisingly, okay? So let me show you how you can embed K7 because this is like totally cool. So let's embed K7 on the torus. And instead of drawing the torus in the donut shape, I'm going to unfold it, okay? So if you take a torus and your donut and you cut it, you can unfold it and get a tube, right? And then you can cut lengthwise across that tube and unfold it and get a sheet of paper, right? So you can draw the torus this way here as a sheet of paper. I shouldn't make it too large here. But at first, this is like, well, this is just a plane then. But this torus, if drawn in this fashion, has a special property, right? It's like Pac-Man. If I go off of this edge here, I reappear over here. That doesn't happen in the plane, right? The plane just goes off into infinity. But in the torus, after I've sliced it, maybe just let me illustrate here. So here's my torus. And what am I doing here? I'm slicing it here and then unfolding it into a long tube. Right. I mean, this this is pretty standard stuff in topology, but you know, maybe we haven't all seen it here. So then I un it ends up in the the you know the toilet paper roll like this. Uh, maybe maybe I'll put these two ends as red. This is a good illustration here. 
So I've chopped it and gone off there. And so like, think about what's going on here, right? If I walk across here, that's going out here and returning over here. So those two things are joined to each other, uh, unlike in a plane. And then I can do another operation and I can just slice it, right? Take your toilet paper roll and cut along lengthwise and then unfold the thing. And then I get, you know, unfolded. Maybe it looks like this. And then notice what happens here. This side's red, this side's red, and the top is blue. Oh, it's black. I didn't, I didn't recolor it. Let's, let's make it green here. So I sliced it here. And it's sliced here. And those two match up. So if I travel off of here, I reappear here. So if my edge, like if I'm trying to draw a graph and I have a vertex here and I draw an edge up there, my edge can reappear there. Okay, that's just, that's equivalent to traveling actually around the length or over the top or those two things. Okay, so it's a better way to illustrate it there. <laughs> yes, so Andy, exactly. If we took the Pac-Man maze and turned it into a graph, the gra yeah, actually, so the maze itself, yeah, I guess the maze itself as a graph would be, well, okay, let's see here. Yeah, I mean, unless you could draw it on a plane without having to use the torus, then it would actually have genus zero. My guess, though, is yeah, you'd need it, it's pretty complex. You'd probably need you, there'd be crossings in that case, right? From that, because then if you're on a an, on a plane, you can't go around the outside. You have to like loop around. Oh, yeah, no way, no way. It has genus zero, right? So, and then you said K five or K seven. I don't remember what you're referring to, but oh yeah, I see what you're referring to. Yes, we already embedded the K five on the torus. Why didn't that erase? I want to embed the K seven. And thus, that also embeds the K6 in, in the meantime, right? We can just ignore one of the vertices. Okay, so let me illustrate here. I'm gonna use a cool trick here. By the way, let me first erase these little bits here. So if I'm gonna draw, uh, let me draw what'll be edges first, okay? So I'm gonna draw these line segments and they're gonna be split up into edges, okay? And this is pretty delicate, so hopefully I don't mess it up too badly. Okay, so I'm just, take, I'm just drawing a line segment for now. So I start in this corner, travel along here, end there, and then it re restarts on the left-hand side here, just like we discussed, and continues at this angle until we reach this corner here. Okay. So if you notice, this line segment is actually just a long, like long curve, closed curve on the torus, right? Because it starts here and goes. Oh, sorry, no, no, it's not. It's just a straight line going from here to here and then here to here. But uh, what do I want to say here? Oh, but this this corner here is actually the same as this thing here when we glue things back together, right? The corners, yeah, the corners are all the same. Actually, we'll employ that to great effect in a moment here, okay? And then we're gonna do something similar. I'm gonna go here, and then this comes, uh, oh boy. What did I do wrong here? Nothing yet. think we're okay. <laughs> and then one more here. Okay, it's obviously supposed to be somewhat like a grid like pattern. But if even if we don't get it perfect, I think we'll be okay. Yeah. By the way, like lines, you know, edges don't have to be straight lines. So we're, we're still okay here. I just want to make sure I get the incidences here. And then this one will go here. And then one more, I think here. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> what's going on here? Let me show you what the vertices are going to be. Here's a vertex, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then one more, the corner here, but that's identical to these corners at the same time. That's, that's the key that makes this picture really easy to draw. So this is vertex one at the same time as this is, these are all copies of vertex one. Right, so I've just moved it to the corner. It's the same vertex, but they're all identified with each other when I fold the thing back on itself. Um, but it just makes the illustration easier if vertex one is duplicated in all those places there at the same time. And then there's two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I claim now that each of these segments represents an edge and that I have a K7 here. I have six, seven vertices, all of which are joined pairwise to each other. Let's check for a couple of them just by hand, but uh, like 
Yeah, and, and the way these things work, it's kind of hard to see, but this edge starting at one, I mean, this segment goes to five to two, and then two comes out here and goes here. Like my illustration's bad, but this is supposed to end at the same point where this one started here. If you want, you can imagine that this is uh, tr like can travel along the edge here and reach this guy. And this one I might have to move like over, like let's do that real quick. I, I shouldn't have crossings, right? So this one, like in order to make, I'm just gonna do a little surgery here should like go over and go up there, right? Just so that this guy can actually reach this guy here and not cross that one, okay? If you draw a nicer picture than mine, you can look this up. Uh, you can avoid that, but let's look at one real quick. So one is adjacent to two, it's adjacent to three, it's adjacent to four, it's adjacent to, how is it adjacent to five? Let's, oh, just here. And then it's adjacent to six, okay? But one was kind of like the easiest one to check because it had four different locations. So let's let's check something maybe <clears throat> more, <clears throat> excuse me, a little more interesting. Let's check like, uh, I don't know, which one should we check? I'm not gonna check them all. So you guys gotta tell me, can someone just put a number in the chat and I'll check that one. Which one looks the hardest? They're all kind of the same. But... Dakota, that looked like a zero, I'm like doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do, let's do four. Let's look at four real quick. I want to see that four is joined to every other uh, other thing. Okay, so four should be joined to two, which is the one that I'm not seeing. Ah, to two, it goes out here, and that's this edge here. Okay, actually, that's not that far off, right? They're they're opposite sides. I, I travel out here, and by you know Pac-Man rules appear here. So it goes to two, it goes to three, it goes doesn't go to four. It's itself. Does it go to five? That should be. Oh, these these two here should not be touching each other. Sorry, this doesn't make any sense, right? That that that's a a bit of a problem. That's just a bad illustration on my part. I think if we go like this, we're okay. So this one going down here is this one going down here, and seven going up here is seven going up here. So four goes here to get adjacent to five. And then four is adjacent to six, four is adjacent to seven, and four is adjacent to one, okay? And so on and so forth. All of them kind of fit like that, okay? You go off the side. Again, if, if you're more careful than me with the drawing, you can make these things match up perfectly, okay? So this means that K7 has genus one. K7 obviously is not planar because K5 isn't, but we managed to embed it on the torus here, okay? And then it turns out K8 uh, has genus greater than one. You can't do it, K8 doesn't work, all right? We're not able to do that. I'm not gonna convince you of that just yet, but it's not possible to do. Okay, so um, yeah, so Eric, uh, I, don't, I don't know the crossing number of K7 offhand, right? And in principle, it could be much, much larger than one because our bound up here only says that the crossing number is bigger uh, potentially, like I mean, the genus is at most the crossing number. Um, I suspect it's more than one, but I, I don't actually know. So, um, however, I did give you guys in the notes a conjecture that tells what the crossing number of a complete graph should be, and uh, I, for seven, it's definitely known. So, I mean, you you could plug in there and, and check it some, somewhere, but I, yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. So, I, my guess is in general, the gap here can be very, very large, arbitrarily large, is my suspicion, but I don't actually know. But the, the point of this theorem is to show a connection between these two parameters, which is of some interest. You know, one of the issues is, in general, we don't know the crossing number of graphs. And actually, knowing the genus of a graph is not all that easy either. I'll end the class with uh, some remarks on that in a moment here. OK, so we can embed some new things on these, on these surfaces. What I want to talk about is, what is the chromatic number of graphs that you can embed on these surfaces? Because we know in the plane, everything that we can draw on the plane is four colorable. You can use four or fewer colors. But now on the torus, we've just proved, for instance, in general, you're going to need at least seven colors. Not for every graph, but there are graphs that require seven colors. K7 takes seven colors. And so if you want to know the smallest number so that every planar, every toroidal, toroidal graph, say, if we use that term, is colorable, you might need as many as seven, right? Or I mean, you definitely need at least seven in general. But what's what's the bound? It turns out seven is always enough. So on the torus, you can do it with seven. Okay. What's cool is we can totally prove this theorem. Like the four color theorem, hard, hundreds of pages long. 
the seven color theorem for the torus and further genuses is very easy and we're going to prove it in a moment here okay which is kind of like crazy like it, it should be harder not easier i mean it's easier to draw but like it's a more complicated situation so it's 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 kind of it's kind of wild okay so in order to do that we need to update the euler characteristic equation okay that's the main tool we're going to need so i'm not going to prove this i'll, I'll give you a rough idea how it works um so this is the euler oops characteristic equation <laughs> and this says let uh, let's say g is embeddable on surface of genus g then we it's the number of vertices of g minus the number of edges of g plus the faces of g i'm just going to call it f of g although until you establish this formula you don't you don't establish that this is a you know a fixed number just like in the Euler characteristic equation, and the answer here is it's equals two minus two times g. That's the, that's this is actually the Euler characteristic equation. Now, remember when g equals zero, you're asking, is the graph planar or not? And when g equals zero, this term here vanishes. And you just have the ordinary Euler characteristic equation. Number of vertices minus number of edges plus faces equals two. OK, so it's just a full on generalization of the original. And actually, the proof is by induction on the genus. So the base case we've we've proved, right? We already did that by hand. OK, so proof, proof is induction on genus G. And base, when G equals 0, is the ordinary Euler characteristic equation is already done. <laughs> Let me give you a hand wavy idea why you get an extra minus two when you increase the genus. Okay. So let's just let's imagine. I mean, technically, this is the inductive step, but I'm just going to look at the torus real quick and convince you that we lose. We get we get a minus two on the right hand side here for the torus. <laughs> So let's say we've got um, a handle here on our graph. And I've embedded the graph on this surface somehow without crossings. And I definitely use the handle. Okay. So what we're going to do here is imagine, now this requires some proof, but my graph, you know, my graph is embedded somehow, no crossings. And there's even there might be vertices and edges along the handle as well. But if you spend a little bit of time you can basically realize that there's got to be a cycle sort of you can draw a cycle around the where the handle meets the surface here okay um it, this might not be like an actual face there might be like extra degree two stuff and so on in there but let's just suppose our graph is like nicely two connected for the purposes here again i'm just talking about the hand wavy proof here all right and these vertices may send edges like you know you can think of this like taking the cycle and squeezing it down exactly so that it corresponds to the point where the uh, uh, the handle touches. Okay, so maybe maybe let me like draw that again here. So then, you know, the handle comes off of this part here, and the graph like literally is has a cycle where that that touches. And then these you know these red vertices here may send further edges like often to the surface of the, the the original sphere here and may send edges up along the handle as well okay so this thing here is not really a face necessarily right because like there's stuff on the inside of it by the way the notion of face is intuitive but we didn't define it clearly right it's still it's still a close an area closed by a uh, a jordan curve but like on a on a on a torus, like it just requires a little bit more thought of what it should be, you know, it like wraps around, but it's still okay. Okay, so what we're going to do then is we're just going to alter this into a planar graph. And the way we're going to do that is at one side of the handle, we're just going to chop it off from the sphere. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I've got my sphere and then I'm going to disconnect it right here. I'm just going to chop so that this now, you know, goes like this and just terminates here. And here's where it like used to connect. I've disconnected it, okay? And when I disconnect that, I've obviously like chopped off some of these red edges here, which I don't wanna do. So what I'm gonna do is duplicate. I had a red loop here and a, a red loop here. I'm just gonna copy it, 
Okay, so like this is this red cycle here is a duplication of this red cycle here. Okay, so I'm introducing new vertices and new edges. And then, you know, whatever this was adjacent to here, it stays adjacent to here. And then this, remember, sent some edges along the torus. That's just done over here with this stuff here. Okay, so all the original edges remain, but I've introduced a new cycle to the graph here. Right, that's the only thing I introduced. So I added a new cycle. Now I claim that the, what's drawn in this picture here is planar. There's definitely no crossings in this picture. There weren't before, and like duplicating it didn't introduce crossings, right? Like all I did was add this loop that was the same as this loop. There were no crossings involving these edges, so they're involving these edges, so there can't be crossings involving these edges either. They're like at the very end of this thing here. Okay. So this is has has no crossings. Okay. And what's drawn in this picture is planar because there's no uh, this is a sphere now. Right? I can take this extended piece here and pull it back in to the uh, the sphere there and project all these edges back onto the sphere and avoid crossings, right? I can just pull this guy in here. If there are other red vertices on this piece here, they're just going to end up like inside of this cycle when it's projected back down. Okay, you, you definitely have to use your imagination here, but you can get the thing drawn on the surface here, and so, um, so it's planar. So it satisfies the ordinary Euler characteristic equation. Okay, but in this new picture, what happened? We added some vertices and we added some edges, but very crucially, the new vertices and edges formed a cycle. And so we added as many vertices as we added ver edges. And so those two things cancel each other out in the Euler characteristic equation. We also got two, exactly two new faces. All the old faces remain. And now we have a face here, which wasn't actually a face before. And we have a face here, which wasn't actually a face before. So the number of faces went up by two. And if you subtract that from both sides, you get original vertices, original edges, because the new edges and vertices cancel. You get faces on the planar graph with an extra two on the left-hand side here. And if you subtract it and put it on this side here, then you have a minus two times one genus. And if you repeatedly do that for each handle, you keep getting two new faces for each handle added there. Okay, So that's the very, very rough idea. Obviously, the full proof is more detailed than that and requires not heavy topology, but definitely like a, a good ex explanation for what the heck is going on. Um, one strategy is to actually triangulate the graph that doesn't affect uh, the characteristic equation, and that makes it a little bit easier to do some of these choppings and stuff like that. Because then you can say, oh, when I meet the, when the handle meets the thing here, it's just a triangle. And then it's a little easier to see that, like, you don't get duplications and stuff like that. Anyway, okay. So, anyway, if you, even if you don't like the proof there, um, we can still claim this statement here. So, if you're drawn on genus G, then you get. Uh, this thing here, okay? And this actually, what we care about for now, implies an edge bound as well, okay? So before, remember, I'm not, I'm, the proof is basically the same, but originally we could use the characteristic equation to get an, a bound on the number of edges, which we called the planar edge bound, which is at most three n minus six, right? Here you can do the same argument and argue, hey, every face is bounded at least by three edges. And if I count edges, face by face by face, every edge will get counted at least at most twice. And therefore, I can write the number of faces, they bound the number of edges times two thirds. This is a proof we already did. Okay? And so we can use the characteristic equation to get the following. I, I'm not gonna prove this one because I wanna get to the actual proof here. Um, so we get a new planar edge bound. I don't know, a genus edge bound that says the number of edges of G is at most. So, so say, uh, let G be N vertex and embeddable on, or actually, let's just say N genus G, right? So it's embeddable on a surface of genus G. Um, then the number of edges is at most 3N minus 6, that's the old bound, plus six times G, okay? And it makes sense, right? The edge bound should be weaker. You can put down more edges, the more genus you have. And actually, what does this say? 
each higher genus seems to allow you to have six more edges than before. That's it. Okay. So the, the torus can have up to six more edges. And actually, if you check the number of edges in K7, it should satisfy this bound, right? Because we were able to embed it. But the proof, the proof of the edge bound is the same idea as the other one. I don't want to go through it. Okay. And actually, I mean, it totally makes sense, right? At the end, you multiply both sides by two. And uh, uh, this, uh, sorry, you multiply both sides by three. And that's where you got the negative six from the two that's in the characteristic equation. But it's not two anymore. It's two minus two G. And so two minus two G becomes six plus six G. Okay. All right. So now let's use this to actually prove uh, the thing that we want. And we should, yeah, we should have enough time for that. <clears throat> okay, so theorem. Sometimes, I mean, this is just the upper bound, but this is sometimes called the Hewood uh, coloring theorem, or Hewood map coloring, or surface coloring uh, problem uh, theorem, or anything like that. Okay, so the chromatic number. Uh, of G that's embeddable uh, on surface of genus G, which is at least one. Remember, I told you this theorem doesn't work for planar graphs, annoyingly. So you have to have at least one or more holes for this theorem in order to work. I'll show you the crucial point where it doesn't work um, is so chi of G is at most, and then the formula is the following. Uh, let me get it right here. And the floor of that. <laughs> yes, Christian's making the correct expression, right? Like, what, what the heck? Like, <laughs> this is seven plus the square root of one plus 48 G all divided by two floor. That's the upper bound, okay? and. It's actually equality. It, it's sharp. I mean, so there are you can't get below this. Like this is this upper bound is sharp. Okay, we're, that part we're not going to prove. So also sharp. So what this means is there exist graphs of genus G that achieve this bound exactly. Okay, but let's let's take a look at a couple examples real quick. So uh, genus one. Uh, yeah, let's in, in the case of genus one. So we're drawing a graph on a torus. This says that we need at most how many colors? Well, let's plug in one for G. You get seven plus the square root of one plus 48. That's suspicious. One plus 40 is 49. The square root of 49 is seven. Seven plus seven is 14 divided by two is seven. So we get chi of G is at most seven on the torus. So any graph drawn on the torus needs at most seven colors. And we saw K7. That, so this suits K7 and also says that in general, you can't do fewer than seven, right? There are graphs that require seven. Now the theorem doesn't hold for genus zero, right? Like I said, you have to have genus at least one, but let's suppose it did and see what it would give, right? It's zero, you get uh, seven plus uh, the square root of one, right? This thing vanishes here, which is eight divided by two, which is four. And so this would say if it worked, that planar graphs are four colorable, which would be the four color theorem if we could get rid of this business here, which you can't, you'll, we'll see when we do the proof, okay? Um, in general, this thing's not always gonna spit out an integer, right? Like I think already with two, you get 48 times two plus one, that's not a perfect square. So you take the square root of that, add seven, divide by two, you're gonna get a non-integer, but then you just round it down, right? Because the chromatic number, like technically the bound, when we prove it, won't have these floor signs. But if I have a chromatic number upper bound of a non-integer, you can always round down, right? Because you, you can't have non-integral uh, chromatic number. Okay, so let's prove this thing here. Um, fortunately, it's not a very long proof, but uh, we, should, we should be able to finish here. Okay. All right, so first let's put, let, let me just write it this way. I'm gonna put K equal to this thing here. So K is this quantity, all right? Uh, just so I don't have to write it down a hundred times. Uh, yeah, and we're going to look at a minimal counter example. So let G be a minimal counter example. I don't know, I just made that up. Um, in other words, chi of G is at least K plus one. Okay, so G is embeddable on a surface of genus G. 
but it required more colors than this thing here. OK, that's what minimal counterexample means. Very simple. OK, so we have to make a couple quick observations. These are very simple. The minimum degree of G has to be at least K. OK, why is this? Otherwise, you can remove that vertex and get a smaller counterexample. OK, so I'm just going to say by min counterexample property. OK, this actually follows from this, if the minimum degree is smaller than K, then the thing will be K colorable. You just, you just order the vertices in the appropriate order um, and then color with this guy here, okay? This also implies surprisingly useful fact in this case that the number of vertices of G, which is N, is at least K plus one. This is a very, very trivial but useful fact. If my minimum degree is K, I need at least k plus one vertices for that to even happen, right? I need a I need a vertex and k neighbors to be available. Probably it has to be much larger than this, but certainly the number of vertices can't be smaller than k. Okay. Now, on the other hand, what's the average degree of this graph? The average degree of g is well, it's simply equal to two times the number of edges of g divided by n, right? That's exactly what the average degree is. Two times the number of edges is the sum of the degrees divided by n is their average. <clears throat> and we have an upper bound on the number of edges, right? The number of edges is bounded above by, well, there's two times the quantity given to us by the, the new planar edge bound, which was three times n minus six plus six g, all divided by n. Not okay. We just put in the upper bound by the planar edge bound. Okay, and then, um, yeah, let's 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 simplify this a little bit. So this is equal to <clears throat> equal to um, multiply through. I get six times n divided by n. I just get six, and then I get uh, let's write it like this: plus minus six plus six g divided by n. Oh, sorry, I made this mistake in my notes too. This is wrong. These should be twelves. 12 and 12, right? And multiply through by two there. And now this is bounded above by the following, six plus negative 12 plus 12 G divided by, so instead of dividing by N, I'm going to divide by something potentially smaller. I'm gonna divide by K plus one, okay? Here is where we're using that G is at least one. Notice if G was zero, then this would be six minus 12, and I can't divide by something smaller with a negative on top and maintain the correct direction of this inequality. I need this quantity to make this replacement. This needs to be greater than or equal to zero in order to replace n with a smaller quantity there. Is that clear to everybody? Right? Otherwise, otherwise this, this substitution flips the, the direction of the inequality if this term up here were negative. Right? So here, this uses that g was at least one. Because like the, that gets this, then this, this quantity here uh, absorbs the negative there and what's left is positive. So it's just, this is it. This is the, it's all like for a computational reason that we need the genus to be big enough, okay? But of course you can ask, well, why did we even make the substitution? Well, let me finish the argument and we'll, we'll see, we kind of had no choice. Um, in, in principle, by the way, you can have graphs on n vertices, which is k plus one and have minimum degree k, right? A complete graph satisfies this property. So n really could be this small. Okay, so now what do we know? We know that the average degree is at most this quantity here. We also know that the average degree is at least k because that's the minimum degree. The average is at least the minimum. So let's put those two equations together or two inequalities together. So thus we have that k is at most uh, six plus negative 12 plus 12 g all divided by k plus one. I don't know why that's six floating in the air there. And uh, how do we solve this? Anybody know already? You may be able to guess because of the statement of the theorem. We have enough time to do it, so I'll continue here. Um, 
Yeah, it's worth it's worth doing once. I'm 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 I'm, I'm going to solve try and solve for k. So multiply both sides by k. I get k times k plus one is at most six times k plus one, and then minus twelve plus twelve g, and then we get k squared plus k is at most six k plus okay plus six minus twelve. We have minus six plus twelve g. Okay, and then uh, let's simplify further. Let's say k squared minus 5k and then plus 6 minus 12g. Put this in parentheses. This is at most zero. How do we solve this? Come on, someone tell me. Quad formula. Yeah, we, we use quadratic formula. Every class should use the quadratic formula once, all right? And I'm actually, I'm actually going to try and do it here. So we've got that k is at most, um, let's see if I can remember. Uh, Okay, I already forgot. Negative b five, plus or minus. We can just assume plus here because it's upper bounded by one of these two. We have to put the worst of the two, right? We can't. So, square root um, b squared twenty five minus four times this thing times one, right? C is one, so four a. I mean, sorry, a is one, c is this. Four times this gives plus twenty four. Wait, what? Minus minus four AC. Minus four AC? Minus four AC. So minus twenty-four plus forty-eight G. All divided by two A, we get that. So this is five plus you get twenty-five minus twenty-four is one plus forty-eight G all divided by two. And this looks like our formula, but it's not our formula, right? This is one less than our formula. The formula is seven plus this thing on top, right? Seven, it's all divided by two. It's off by, it's off by, it's off by one. This is actually a contradiction, right? K equals um, the floor of seven plus root uh, one plus 48 G over two. And I just told you that it's something smaller. So it's a contradiction, okay? Now you may be wondering why can't I have like six instead here, okay? I don't want to dwell on that, but you, you can't because it, it has to do with properties of integers. I realize this theorem would be much more satisfactory and it can be rewritten in a fashion that you end up with K is at most of this quantity here directly, arguing directly. It's, there are ways of seeing it that way. I think in the, the green book, the Zhang uh, book, it's done that way. But what's annoying is that you have to use another theorem. Um, the min here, minimal counterexample gives us minimum degree condition right away. But if you just say G is embeddable, like I don't know anything about it, it's a minimum degree, right? If it's embeddable on G, it might have minimum degree two or one or three or whatever. And then I can't use this bound. So there's some other work you have to do. You have to look at all the induced subgraphs and it's annoying. But the point is, <clears throat> we get a contradiction here. If, um, to the fact that it's a minimal counterexample. So no minimal counterexample ex exists. Okay, this is actually a weird contradiction too, because we said it's a minimal counterexample Therefore, its chromatic number is one more than k. And from that, I derived that its chromatic number was one less than k. Like it, it's like overkill, right? But whatever, it works. And we got to use the quadratic formula, which is like really cool. Um, and then it turns out, I'm, I'm not gonna, uh, let me just conclude with a couple words here. It turns out that this quantity is always achievable. There's always, in fact, a complete graph big enough that guarantees that you will need this many colors uh, on, on the torus or something with 50 holes. You know, you plug in G equals 50 and you get some large number. There's a large enough complete graph that is embeddable that requires that many colors as well, okay? So let me conclude with one more thought here. So we saw this like version of the four color theorem on other surfaces was way easier than the four color theorem. This is super easy, but it doesn't work for the plane. But what's interesting here, which is truly bizarre is on the plane, the chromatic number is hard to find, but to understand what's a planar graph is easy. Kuratovsky's theorem says they're characterized by K5s and K33s, whether you have a, sub, a subdivision or not. If you want to know whether a graph is genus one, drawable on a torus or not, there are also forbidden subdivisions, right? You can say, hey, it can't have a subdivision of a K7, for instance, I mean, a K8, for instance, and it can't have a subdivision of a K other things, right? It turns out though, there's 800 different graphs that characterize these things, not two, but 800 different subdivisions that are forbidden for, for a torus. And, and so it's like, 
what's going on here? Chromatic numbers easy, but characterization super hard. Like there's this like conservation of difficulty between these problems here. Andy, it's more it's more than 800. It's some somewhere around 800. But yeah, eight, there's something like 800. And for larger surfaces, for higher genuses, it's known that it's finite. But the quantity, I don't know what it is. Right? It's like yeah, it's so like Kuratowski's theorem for toruses would have 800 examples you can't have. So all right. <laughs>